Today on See, Here Love, we prepare ourselves for Good Friday and Easter with part one of our present suffering and what it means to be Resurrection People series. Part one focuses on the suffering of Jesus and our suffering this past year, that when we suffer, we're more like Him than we realize. Join us now as we reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus. Well, welcome to See, Here Love, and it is good to be back with you from our studio space as we continue to share faith stories of what God is doing in and through us, transforming us. Well, today is part one of our two-part series called Our Present Suffering and What It Means to Be a Resurrection People. It's our Good Friday and Easter series. And part one is where we focus on Jesus' suffering and how our suffering is connected with his. And part two, we focus on Jesus' resurrection and what it means to be a resurrection people. And this is where I get to sit down and talk and listen with four incredibly diverse and interesting pastors as they share their thoughts on suffering. Well, author and podcaster Peter N. says it best this way. When we cry out, God, why have you forsaken me? We are experiencing something of what Jesus experienced on the cross when he cries out those same words in Matthew 27, 46. The New Testament gets at this idea of suffering with Christ in different ways. And in Colossians 1.24, I am now rejoicing in my, in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. What exactly is lacking in Christ's afflictions and is completed by our suffering? I don't know. But it looks like our suffering intimately and mystically connects us to Jesus' suffering in a powerful way that benefits others. Wow, thank you, Peter. So let's get started. Listening, pondering, reflecting, and learning from these inspiring guests for the next two weeks who are leaders, teachers, and pastors. We start off with Elle Pike, the founding member of the New Leaf Church Planting Network and a lay minister with the Free Methodist Church of Canada. Then Chris Chase, he's the lead pastor of the Meeting House New Market and an ordained minister for over 18 years of experience in pastoral ministry. Then we have Karina Shea, lead pastor of Parkway Forest Community Church, a diverse multicultural church community in Toronto with over 25 years in pastoral ministry. And then Jen Burnett, lead pastor at the Well Church in Kelowna, British Columbia, who has ministered in Ontario and Australia in a variety of contexts. Here we go. Well, I am so thrilled and honored to be in the presence of four amazing leaders with me for our Good Friday and Easter show. Thank you, Elle Pike and Jen Burnett and Karina Shea and Chris Chase for being with me today. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I am so excited about this. I, I love the work that you're all doing. And, um, and especially for Easter and Good Friday, we need some great wise voices uh, to speak into this topic. But before we do, I want to ask you these questions, especially when you've get a bunch of pastors together. You've got to find out the funny parts of your life and jobs. So let's start with this question. Most hilarious mistake that you've ever made at the pulpit or the weirdest, funniest response that you have received when you said that your job and vocation is a pastor. Who would like to go first? I, I, I can't wait to hear your responses. Uh, maybe Chris, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I don't know if it's funny or crazy, but uh, I was speaking at a, at a camp and I remember I was standing in a certain space and most pastors don't look like me. Just kind of leave that, leave it out there <laughs> into the atmosphere a little bit. And um, so I'm there with these students and they're asking where the pastor is. And I really don't say anything. And then somebody finally realizes that it's me. And there's this kid from Toronto and he says, yo fam, I didn't know pastors could look like that. And we're looking at each other and we're wearing the exact same outfit. And he's like, he, I, I'm, he's 20 years younger than I am and realizing like maybe either he's trying hard to be, to be older or I'm trying way too hard to be trendy. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good one. Al, what about you? Oh, I've got a doozy of a story. Um, so uh, this is probably about three years ago. I was asked to come and speak at this event. Uh, I live in the Waterloo region. So it was a, a tech event through an organization called Faith Tech. So it was kind of Christian business leaders and techie people and pastors all in this room at this uh, tech company in town. It's probably like 200 people. I was pretty nervous. 
So I, you know, I practice this great talk, I pull it off. I'm like, oh gosh, I was so proud of myself. I prepared, it went so well. So I get off the stage feeling rather fabulous. And my best friend tells me your fly was down the entire time that you gave me that talk. Do you always now check yourself, check oh, yourself, like even, crazy, like even more so? Oh, I yeah. ask people sometimes it gets awkward, but you do that once you don't want to make that mistake again. So that's awesome. All right. <laughs> Karina for you, something fun, wonderful, weird. A new family, and a, a man had come to our church. They were visiting. He came up, somebody, he said, you know, who's the pastor? So they pointed and there was a group of us standing together. So he went over and of course spoke to the oldest man in the group and he pointed to me and said, that's our pastor. And he stopped and his eyes got really big and he said, but you're a woman oh. and you're so Asian. Oh. And then he immediately summoned his whole family over and he said to them, isn't this amazing? We come to Canada and this is our pastor. This is our new pastor. Gather around, let me take a picture. And so they took pictures with me <laughs> and it was so awkward and so uncomfortable. I'd never received such a, uh, a shocked and enthusiastic reaction all at once. Oh, I actually love that. At first I thought it was gonna be going somewhere differently the story. And then I was gonna be like rallying for a unit sister. I've got your back and who is this person? Like I was literally, and then when you went, but then the picture. Yes. Okay. Well, that changes everything. Yeah. All right, Jen, you're finishing up this, our wild, wonderful, and hilarious moments. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, I have a lot of stories about moments in the pulpit and to the point where I go, should I really be doing this? Um, but this one maybe takes the cake. <clears throat> so I had gotten dressed in the morning and I had a button down shirt, probably some poly cotton type blend. I, I'm not really sure of my fabrics, but um, you know, and I had the mic on and, and it was pretty low key. And so, you know, I opened in prayer and then we moved to worship and that was all good. But somehow during worship time, I must have ripped my shirt. <laughs> So post-worship, I get up and I look down and I realize that just kind of under my boob area, there is like this rip in my shirt. Not a little rip, a big rip. Now what's more awkward is whatever the type of shirt I'm wearing is, the rip is going up. I'm standing there. I can feel it tearing more. <laughs> So I say to my congregation, well, here's what it is. I'm going to preach this sermon unless anyone else wants to. And you're going to stop me if it gets too awkward. <laughs> I can't even, I can't believe that actually happened. That's amazing. True story. <laughs> I mean, oh, you guys, these were great stories. I want to sit and talk with you more about all these great stories. Because I know there's probably a lot more things that have happened to you. But I love that you can laugh and have fun in the experience as you look back and even during. So thanks for sharing that. What a hilarious and fun group of pastors. And yes, pastors can be fun. You should have heard them before and after our interview. Well, coming up next, our monthly contributor and author, Addison Bevere, shares his thoughts on Good Friday and Easter. And if you haven't ordered our first ever new See Here Love book, Always Know, a collection of brave stories and words from 50 contributors who have been guests on our show. Now is your chance. Thanks, Melinda. So good being here with you. I think uh, in this Lent season, as we're leading up to Easter, especially for those of us who've followed Jesus for a long time, I think it's important for us to take a step back and ask ourselves, why Jesus? Why the cross? Like, what is the mystery here? What is the majesty? What are we supposed to lean into as the followers of Jesus? When we look at the story of the cross, we see this story of reconciliation. We see a story of God crossing the divide between his divinity and our humanity by becoming the bridge. He did all of these things, as the gospels tell us, to save us from our sins. But what is so significant about this idea of salvation of sin? Why, why does it matter? Like, is it just some, is it what happens when we break an arbitrary set of rules? 
Or is it something so much deeper than that? And when we look at sin, what we find is we actually find a violation of relationship. First and foremost, our relationship with God. Second, our relationship with ourselves. And third, our relationship with others. And if you look at the brokenness of our world, you'll actually find that every form of brokenness is a violation of relationship. So what Jesus did in coming and and living to teach us how to die and really dying to show us how to live, what he was doing is he was showing us how to reconcile relationally. He was showing us that everything meaningful in life happens at the intersection of relationship. And he was teaching us a new way to be human. The old power struggle, the old way of doing things just wasn't working. And Jesus, love incarnate, came and said, hey, watch me. Watch me, not only am I gonna die for your sins, I'm gonna send you my spirit and I'm gonna teach you what it means to be the people of God. Y'all, this is what Easter is all about. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish from sin but have life eternal. This is the message of the cross. It's the ultimate message of relationship. And if we're going to be people who learn how to do this humanity thing right, we're gonna have to learn what it means to follow Jesus. From the host of See, Here Love, Melinda Estabrooks and 50 of her guests and friends comes the book, Always Know, full of stories of lives that are inspiring, wise, and life-changing. God hears you. He hears your prayers. He hears the longing for connection. He hears the cries of pain that you're experiencing, and He loves you deeply. This month, with your ministry gift of $25 or more, or when you become a new monthly donor, request your copy of Always Know. It is a collection of stories to help you today in the things that you're struggling with, the things that you are confronted with. And I know that these stories will encourage you. Call 1-800-265-3100 or visit seeherelove.com slash always know and request your copy. While we're back with our pastor's panels, I ask them this question. As we approach Good Friday and Easter, and we acknowledge the suffering that we and many have experienced this year during the pandemic, how does the suffering of Christ speak to you differently this year than previous, or does it? Here are their responses. Well, as we talk about Good Friday and Easter, that's coming up this week. We look at our year, a year of crisis, a pandemic, incredible racial tensions, loss, grief. I want to talk through suffering and how it connects to the suffering of Christ this Easter. And my question to you is in light of the suffering we have experienced, our families have, our friends, our congregations, our colleagues, has the suffering of Christ as we go into Easter and understanding his suffering changed for you, enlightened you more, uh, you know, this year more than ever, or or has it? I don't want to assume anything about that. Elle, I want to start with you. The suffering of Christ in a year that we are experiencing now. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but it's been a a profoundly difficult year in a lot of ways uh, for me and for some of my family members. Um, we had a, a death in the family. We weren't able to to gather together in the normal ways that uh, we would to grieve. And, and um, yeah, I don't pretend to understand the incarnation uh, or the, the mystery surrounding that or what that's like. But I, when I think about suffering this year and think about Easter, I'm I'm just so taken aback by the concept in scripture where, you know, Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the father and understanding what the incarnation really meant that the concept of a God who, whose essence defining love led him to suffer for us. Um, And uh, the idea that God would choose not to remain apart from our suffering, but to actually partake in it. And so I think throughout this year, I've just been, whether it's watching, um, the racial justice stuff and some of the difficult things we've seen on TV, um, whether it's been the pandemic, COVID, I've just been taken aback with the notion that Jesus is present in that suffering and that that's what the incarnation means. 
uh, when we think about that. Um, one of my favorite theologians, um, Dr. Willie Jennings, he's, um, he's a Duke Divinity. He has this line, it's, it's like, uh, we who are Jesus followers, we, we work in wounds, we are working with wounds, and we work through wounds. And that's like a profound statement. I, you know, that's, I'm sure he's got a lot to unpack there. But that really struck me this year that I think a lot of us uh, have lived privileged lives, and we haven't been working with wounds maybe the way that uh, this year has uncovered for us. So I think that um, experiencing that notion of suffering, leaning into our own vulnerabilities, walking with people who have experienced profound suffering, if we're not transformed by that, um, I don't know, I, I, we're missing something. Um, but I, I think that's one of the things that has just become so tangible to me this year. Jesus understands our sufferings. Thanks. Great thoughts on that and the incarnation and the, the choosing to suffer with us. I think that's, that's something to really kind of think on and, and sit on to and ponder. All right, Chris, your thoughts about the suffering of Christ in a year like this. We, we often in church, you know, we've heard the saying, you know, Friday's here, but Sunday's a coming when it comes to the Good Friday, Easter Sunday weekend. We often kind of spend a lot of time moving towards Easter and churches will do presentations or cantatas if you still use that language or th that sort of thing. We kind of move towards, it becomes more outreach focused and gathering people into buildings and sharing this, the story of the gospel. And, um, and Good Friday is a moment that leads to Easter Sunday. And this year has felt a lot more like Good Friday than Easter Sunday from, you know, March 13th or 15th of 2000 to where we are recording this now. It's felt like, you know, Jesus saying, Father, the hour has come. This has been the longest hour of our lives in many respects. And when I think of the suffering of, of Jesus, I think of, of one of his sayings, woman behold, a son, son behold thy mother. And the idea of him caring about community. In the midst of him dying on the cross, he's able to look at his mom and look at John and say, you need each other. And how valuable I found that in the midst of the suffering that I've, I've experienced in, in my life, you know, um, you know, all these sort of things for the, my mom being sick or not being able to visit, um, not being able to see friends, um, not being able to buy new Jordans. That's as facetious and not as important as the rest of the stuff. But, you know, like all those, all those pieces that he's like, he allows me to still care for other people too. Because while he was suffering, he was willing to able to stop and pause and say, you two still need each other as well. And so when I think of his suffering in light of this year, um, I'm, I'm mindful that community matters. Zoom sucks, but community, it matters greatly. And if we, we miss that, then we were insulated. And then we're kind of just trying to get to the next thing. And maybe, you know, as much as none of us like this season right now that we're in, this chapter of life that we're in, it only makes that Easter Sunday moment that much sweeter when it happens because we've actually um, taken in what it means to have that suffering be a part of our lives. So mm -hmm. it's a weird thing. I'm not a fan of it, um, but I recognize that it's only going to make us as pastors and leaders and brothers and sisters and friends and family that much better because we're going to be that much more intentional with the time that we spend with each other. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, I, I didn't think about that. You know, Jesus is on the cross and yet he's still like, Hey, take care of my mom. Like for me, I'd be like, no, me, yeah. everything is me right now. I'm the one suffering and hurting. So all love and care for me right now. I, you know, like, and don't ask me to do anything else because it's me. Right. I, I think that's a really good point, Chris. And it's like, actually, he, there he is suffering and he's thinking, someone please take care of my mama and thinking always sort of other centered and others. Wow. In the midst of suffering, that's really good. And the need for community. I really appreciate that. It's great. Jen, for you suffering as we, as we think about Good Friday and Easter this year. I think one of the things um, that it reminds me of is that in in our Christian story, suffering isn't antithetical to the goodness of God or Jesus, but 
it's actually a central part of the story. Um, and that Jesus would willingly suffer and voluntarily suffer because of love um, always blows my mind. And, and also reminds me that no matter how big a mess we are in, and, and you mentioned like this year hasn't just been one side of suffering, it's been like layer on layer on layer. And it's so much that you can't even peel it back. And I feel like it's this big mess that instead of Jesus just going, oh, I'll just pluck you out of that, Jesus steps into it with us um, and grieves with us and aches with us. And that it's in our grieving, in walking through it, that we also position ourselves to receive hope. Um, but you have to go through it. You can't avoid it. Um, and you'll be changed for it but richer for it too. And I think that's, that's the invitation that a suffering Christ extends to us is go ahead, walk through it. Um, and I will walk with you until we get to the other side. Mm. Jen, such a great reminder. And it's so, you know, when I hear what you're saying, it's like counterintuitive. It's like, when you suffer, get me out, pluck me out. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to feel pain. And just your reminder to say, actually, you know, that is part of our journey in life with, with Christ. And the beautiful thing, though, is in the suffering, he comes. Right. Excellent. It's good, Jen. Thank you. Karina, sort of like bringing us all here to, to, at the end of our thoughts on suffering as we approach Good Friday and Easter. Sure. This is actually our second, right? Second Easter yes. season in lockdown. And I think the pandemic has exacerbated and you know, here's what I don't understand is, is, I mean, I do understand, but I don't like it, how COVID-19 has exacerbated all of the, it's, it's been like a pressure cooker for everything that's hard. And I don't know why it also hasn't been a pressure cooker for all, for all the things that are wonderful. But, you know, we've seen so much fracture, so much loss, so many dreams put on pause. Uh, in our own congregation, we've had so many people affected by COVID-19, either directly or indirectly. There's been so much... Um, breakdown of relationship and so many mental health issues that have come to the fore and you know it's a great lament it's been a great lament of the church to not be able to observe good friday and celebrate resurrection sunday together and yet we all know in our hearts that even a pandemic can't stop easter and it cannot stop the joy and the hope that it points us towards I don't know that Easter this year uh, speaks to me differently so much as it speaks perhaps more intensely and with a greater urgency to me. That heartache uh, that I feel to, to have people really get to know the real Jesus and to experience a saving grace, just it weighs on my heart differently this year. The suffering of Christ doesn't end our suffering, you know, on the side of heaven, but it does help us to recognize that Jesus understands. He understands our pain, he understands our struggles and our fear, but he doesn't just understand. He also offers us hope for tomorrow and a way forward. That is profound. You know, the question is always, where is God in our suffering? Where is Jesus in our suffering? And you know, and Ellie Weisel says in his book Night, you know, he says, he's right there beside you. He's suffering along with you. He weeps with you. He carries you through. And that is a hope that is not just, you know, I hope it's going to rain kind of hope. It's a, a true confidence. We know it's true. It's coming. And, you know, and Chris is absolutely right. And it's not just because I'm Pentecostal, <laughs> you know, that, that Sunday's coming. Uh, it is coming. And, you know, there's a day when he will wipe every tear from our eyes. And there will be no more pain and no more suffering and no more struggle. And, you know, that's, that's the promise that helps us to get through, you know, the journey that Jen is alluding to, you know, getting through that suffering to find ourselves in that place of sure victory, you know, and knowing it's there is what helps us to endure, I think, and persevere. Mm -hmm. So the suffering of Christ at Easter, it means everything. And, you know, so, so the longing and that, that urgency, I feel much more profoundly because mm -hmm. people need Jesus and people yes. need this hope. 
Mm, such a rich and honest and meaningful conversation with Elle, Chris, Karina, and Jen. I am so thankful for them and for their leadership in Canada. And speaking of leadership and impact, here's Reverend Lisa Pack, global strategist for finishing the task, sharing her thoughts from Philippians 3.10 from The Good Word. Thank you, Mel. Today's passage is from Philippians 3.10, where the Apostle Paul writes, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, these are serious words, and I can hear a little voice at the back of my head, both in my head and my heart, I should say, saying, I don't need anyone else's suffering. I've got plenty of my own as it is. But that's not what this passage means. Paul is not saying that he simply wants to add to his current suffering like compounded interest. Remember in Matthew 11, Jesus himself tells those who are weary and burdened to come to him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It also doesn't mean that all suffering is participation in Christ's suffering. For example, if you didn't study for an exam and failed, if you didn't pay your taxes and are fined, or if you said something in anger and strained a relationship, this is not participation in Christ's suffering. This is facing the consequences and the effects thereafter of our poor decisions. There's a whole category of suffering that is brought about because of our own bad choices. I've experienced this and I know you have as well. So what does it mean for us to participate in Christ's suffering? Well, let's consider who Christ is and what he suffered for. Jesus Christ is a sinless son of God who came to this world to save humankind from sin. His purpose was to save humankind so that we might not perish but have eternal life. His suffering cannot be divorced from his purpose. In those moments that we suffer because of this same purpose as Jesus, loving our neighbor, overcoming evil with good, serving others, turning the other cheek, being the voice for the weak and the defenseless, striving for mercy and justice, all for the purpose of demonstrating God's love just as Jesus did on the cross, this is when we begin to participate in his suffering. And let the word of God assure us, participation in Christ's suffering makes us more like him. It also doesn't just end with suffering, but it draws us closer to him and into fellowship with others who are in the body of Christ. And there is always victory and resurrection. Nothing is left just as suffering in God's hands. Whether it's our fault or not, nothing is left ugly in God's hands. Suffering does not reign, and of this I am sure, because that is the promise and power of the resurrection. What an incredible show. So many emotions and so many good God truths. I think the best way to sum it up is to continue hearing from author and podcaster Peter Enns when he wraps it up with this. Suffering is not a sign that something is wrong with us and has to be corrected. Suffering is a key component of what identifies us as children of God. From Philippians 3, 10 to 11, as Reverend Lisa Pack shared, Peter continues with, knowing Christ for the Apostle Paul means not only experiencing the power of Jesus' resurrection, the triumphs and spiritual highs of the life of faith, the parts we can all quickly get on board with, it also means necessarily experiencing the dark times, the sharing of Christ's sufferings, participating in them. The two go together. Sharing Christ's suffering and death goes hand in hand with experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection. So when weariness and hopelessness settle in, at that very moment, our suffering is Christ's suffering and he is ours. We are more like Christ in these moments than we realize. Hmm. I hope our conversation today encouraged you as we approach Good Friday and Easter. And for more Easter resources, blogs, and additional content, go to seeherelove.com. And we'll see you for part two next week on what it means to be a resurrection people. And until then, remember this promise. Always know in your suffering, you are seen, heard, and deeply loved by God. Bye-bye.